Stephen, we wanted to make a, uh, a video or a video series of the journey of your life, really, I suppose. Um, where does it start? Where's your first memories, your first spiritual memories, first idea that perhaps you were just a little bit different? Well, I don't know about feeling different, but it most certainly goes right the way back to when I was a very, very small child, um, uh, even to the ages of about two, three. Uh, and I, it all really goes back to when my granddad, uh, or my grandfather, if I want to be posh, uh, but my grandfather, little did I know, was a Londoner, uh, but he'd also served in the Boer War and the Great War and I used to sit there, I can't remember this, and I would reenact scenes particularly from the First World War where some of his comrades would have would have fell on Flanders fields <clears throat> and it became just a natural thing and my grandfather he used to just say well then go on and uh, years later when I met my spiritual teacher uh, Jack Corbett he, he would tell me about this and he'd give me, he knew all about this and uh, my, he said it was just a fact that my grandfather allowed it to happen. He'd seen many terrible atrocities in war, but here was me as a young boy, and I used to speak as an adult, which was unusual. And <clears throat> years later, I met my mother. I don't, I don't particularly have been very close to my mother, but I had a, a period of time of about two and a half hours in around about 2002, where nobody else was at her house, and we were able to speak about me being a child. And, and she used to say, oh, she said to me, oh, yeah, we used to give messages to people and things like that. And I thought, well, I said, but how do people think? She said, well, they just said, well, our Stephen's different. And I was like that. And I can remember, <clears throat> even now, certain particular points. And also I can remember the great affinity I had with my grandfather. And I think that was, was important. So I was in a, a safe environment. Uh, and I think that's important for a child. And many, many children have what we often term as invisible friends but, but they are companions of light and they come to inspire us right to the point uh, when I can remember being frightened uh, I'd be perhaps five I can remember being outside my grandfather lived in a, a place called Radford in Nottingham which is an area I work in now it's an area my life revolves around but I remember this particular night it, I would say October November time the stars were bright I think I've always looked at the stars um, but I remember this girl talking about ghosts and phantoms and things and at that point it all stopped. I was aware there was other things. I was always aware as a child right the way to when I was in the Royal Navy. I was also aware there was another vibration that had moved around us and I know it sounds silly but uh, I can remember once when my mother went in for a major operation and she said I could feel myself floating from this life and she said I could hear the voices of people I knew and I, I said to her did you see any cats and dogs? You'd never stupid ask Stephen. And it wasn't a stupid question. It was a question I wanted to know about. <clears throat> and I remember my father re reenacting when he had major surgery, which was obviously leading up to ultimately his, his death of, with cancer, talking about the same thing. So to me, um, it, it was a natural thing. But the problem with most people, it, brought, it brings in fear. And to a degree, from the age of about five, the spiritual, to a degree, was put to one side. The spirit would allow me to live my life uh, and eventually, as years went by, I had to work very, very hard, as all people do, that to be truly inspired and truly enlightened, you have to take fear away. And there is no fear in the world of light. It's a very interesting thing that you said. It, it, it stopped, you know. Uh, what, was, it, was this you just kind of stopping this activity or just sort of turning off from it or...? I'm getting this idea that from uh, as a young structure, five or six, you started to have possibly some kind of gift, and then for a period of years it kind of went away. Really, I suppose it was that you just putting it back in a box, or I think it's, I think it's two things. I think we put it away to one thing that you've got to live, you've got to live your life. My mother used to say the trouble with our Stephen is mine's too fast. They used to come out with statements you shouldn't possibly know about. Well, they let me just become an ordinary child as everybody else is. I had a great sensitivity. I used to go to Sunday school, uh, sad as it sounds, but uh, my motivation to go to a district of uh, Nottingham called Beeston to Sunday school was really motivated by two things in those days, and fully our motivation in life takes you to one thing. One, they had a lot more girls at the was, area. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> yes, that was one part. <laughs> uh, and also the fact my, my, uh, my aunt Gert, or Gertrude, she, uh, she used to look after me and... Uh, 
uh, I also used to get a very, very nice rice pudding. So, my, my, so perhaps rice pudding and girls was leading me to the, uh, the, the Methodist Church. I preferred the Methodist to the Church of England. But I went there for a period of time <clears throat> and, um, and then that basically faded away until really the main journey of my life started in 1962. Tell me about 1962 then. Uh, this is a time you were leaving Hull. Yes, I left home. Growing up? <clears throat> yeah, I left home. <clears throat> I wanted to to join the Royal Navy. Uh, my father had been in the Royal Navy. I had no aspirations to go into the uh, British Army. Nothing against that, but I didn't want the Army and I definitely didn't want the Air Force, but I wanted to be in the Royal Navy. And uh, my father had served uh, in the war. And so... Did they do a good rice pudding? I don't know. <clears throat> The, the rice pudding was terrible. The food was awful, particularly when I first joined up. But um, I, I remember very, very clearly in 1962, it was the, uh, uh, the 9th of October. At five minutes past nine, I left my home with a case and basically walked uh, to uh, the recruiting office, which was in Carrington Street in Nottingham. And uh, I always remember I stopped off at a friend's of the families who was a very, very well-decorated uh, regimental sergeant major in the British Army, uh, tremendously uh, decorated, uh, what you call a hero, but uh, heroes never talk about it, they, uh, they see it as a part of their duty. And I remember arriving at the, uh, at the recruitment office. And so how old are you at this time? 15. 15? 15. And I saw uh, the lieutenant, or if you're in America, the lieutenant, and he said to me, you will travel the world, you will meet some of the richest people and some of the poorest people, but you will be able to communicate with them. And that's happened. I remember getting on the train, we went to London, we went to what was to be called be a, a base for a year called HMS Ganges, uh, which was in Suffolk, sadly no longer exists. Uh, but I remember very, very much, and even where I sat on the bus, and it was a, a lot of people found the regime tyrannical, really. Uh, it was really going back to almost Victorian times. Uh, I wouldn't exactly say I enjoyed it, but there was no way I was going to fail because I wasn't going to fail and uh, bring shame on the family. So I, I saw it through and uh, I left there in 1962, finished my training around the time just after uh, John JFK, yeah. John Kennedy, uh, was assassinated. And, uh, and then at the end of 1963, I went on to the fire station at a Royal Naval Air Station in Caldrose and I, I enjoyed that job. But I had to change. I had to become one of the rest of the sailors uh, I had to change very quickly. Very interesting um, but you were saying you become one of the sailors and you know kind of fit in and that's what the forces are about yet through your to, perhaps towards the end of your forces work you started to uh, rediscover the the spiritual side of things? Yeah it did uh, when I first joined the Navy uh, you know I didn't really uh, talk about it, uh, you know, yeah, there might be people talk about odds and ends about it, but nothing that really led in. When I went on to an aircraft carrier in 1964, I was like 64, 65 and 66, a couple of things happened. One, we used to have a chap called, I can say his name, his name is because he's now passing to life, his name was Taft Capewell. He actually came from Hereford, which is in England, not Wales. Right. <clears throat> and he used to do a Ouija board uh, around a table. Now, I don't believe you should get involved in, in that. Because if you're not trained, you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have somebody off the street to come in and do your electrics if there wasn't a trained or qualified electrician. It's dangerous because not everybody is uh, ascends into into pure light when they pass on. Because there are some, shall we say, not such nice people in the world. We know that, um, and so you've got to be very careful. But he used to do this, and I kept well away from it because something told me. Uh, and I was very sensitive of the spirit world being around. I, I, I was aware of it. It was starting to grow again. Uh, but I didn't mess. But where a big thing happened, in 1966, uh, we went to Singapore, which was a regular thing. We've got to Singapore at the Far East, Hong Kong, Philippines. And we went and one of the lads came back and said, oh, by the way, uh, I went to a fortune teller. Well, within a couple of days, everybody had been. And uh, I was one of them. And I always remember it. It's very, very strange. We went to this place in a place called, if anybody's in the Royal Navy watching this video, 